it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 136 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Oh, today is the incredible Brazilian coffee. It has nutty notes of chocolate and vanilla. That is super yummy. And you too can drink Bantam Coffee Roasters. Where can they find it? BantamRoasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. So are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing? It's 4th of July. I know. Yay! Fireworks! (laughs) I'm great on this side. How are you? Yeah, we're good. It's always a fun day around the neighborhood. We kind of hang out and just put up the badminton thing and yeah, the you net. Should, we'll go to I my, forgot what it was called. It's a badminton net. Badminton net, yeah. We'll I'm, all, to, I'm really good at badminton. If you remember in high school, we were the team to beat in badminton. I was just about to tell you a story. And that is a couple of weeks ago. My sister had the badminton net up at her house. And I cleaned them all up, even the kids. Oh, the kids are bad. I know. I'm like, you should have had that. That's what I say every time they miss it. I'm like, you should have had that. Mm. Badminton and here's a blast from the past, croquet. Oh, yeah. We play croquet all the time. My croquet. extended family. I mm-hmm. mean, like these kids these days, they don't know about these yard games. I know. We were supposed to have all that set up for my wedding, but everyone was having so much fun, they never even made it out there to play. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I know, I right? Know that. Yeah, that's because no one ever made it out of the party barn to play anything. Oh, <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> you were sitting right there next to me. Yeah. So, yeah, w- just doing stuff around here. And 4th of July is like we have an historic horse farm that's what? A quarter mile from my house. Only, yeah. Only. It's been there since 1800s, mm-hmm. since the 1800s. And it's family owned. It's beautiful. And mm-hmm. every 4th of July, they do their own private little fireworks oh, over there. Okay. So we drive over there and just sit on the fence line. And we don't have to go anywhere, so it's nice. I don't have to go anywhere either. Oh, because your neighbors set them off. I stand in the side field with the sheep (laughs) and watch the fireworks sail overhead. It's a good time. (laughs) Your sheep are very, they don't like them, though. Well, no, it's so loud. They're loud. I always, I kind of wonder how the chickens do with them. But I feel like they're in the house, so they're kind of like, they know they're protected. Right. The sheep don't know what the heck is going on. Fortunately for me, I've never had a dog with problems with them, and my dogs don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't even wake up. Mine bark. Mine are just like, huh? What? No, River and Tulip bark. And once everything settles down and we get the sheep calmed down, we usually go watch a movie and- yeah. You know, have a quiet evening to ourselves. Yeah, so we just go right up there and watch them over the farm. And they have like a big thing over there for the people who board their horses yeah. and everything. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. But generally, we just hang out in the yard and play yeah. yard games and well, have drinks. Yes. <laughs> that's a lovely 4th of July, really. <laughs> exactly. And everybody's always like, can we let the chickens out? Sure. Mm. Are you going to watch them? watch them? <laughs> that's the question. You going to watch them? So, yeah, I can't believe it's July already. It goes so fast. Yeah, it really does. Okay, this brings me to this. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It does two things. The first is you never miss an episode. And the second is it's another great way to help the show grow. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. Lots of them. You can visit our Etsy shop, 
see what we have merchandise wise there. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. We have a fantastic group of patrons. Oh, I love the Zoom calls these days. And thank you to our newest. Yes. And the other thing you can do to help the podcast is visit our website and or our show notes. Use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chicken? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. It's time for Breed Spotlight. Was that a snare drum? I think that was a snare drum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was my 4th of July. Okay. Like little fife and drum action, maybe? It was. Okay. What was that? <laughs> was that a rifle? Yes. The only reason I knew that is because she's making a hand motion, like talking a rifle. Yeah. That was the 4th of July, okay. Independence Day. And and what is the breed? Let's do. What is the breed? The Dominique. Yay! It's the Dominique. We've been saving the redo of the Dominique for the 4th of July show mm-hmm. because it's one of the earliest chickens to... The United States of America. That's right. That's right. It's, I don't know if everybody knows that or not, but it is. There's evidence that some of the Spaniards who came to the New World early on brought right. some chickens with them. I want to say there were some bantam bones discovered on the West Coast that mm-hmm. were quite old. But as far as English colonies and the East Coast of the U- what became the United States, it's the Dominique. Yeah. Yeah. Not the Plymouth Bard Rock. One of the things that... That's a myth. Oh, yeah, yeah. They weren't here for another 230 years or something. (laughs) One of the things that always surprises me about these very old historical breeds is that they're some of the most practical animals around. I mean, they're so at home on a modern homestead. When you think about like colonial chickens, and that's kind of what you're thinking about at that Mm -hmm. that time and frame is these chickens were utility chickens. They were there to do a job. They needed the eggs. They needed, you know, so... They are worker bees for you. Absolutely. On top of being beautiful. The thing I find most funny about the Dominique is the Dominique looks a heck of a lot like the Plymouth Bard Rock. Or vice versa. Right. So, which we know yeah, why. But this chicken is one that would work for a colonial farm and be a worker chicken. Like, Absolutely. Most. The beautiful Dominique is an absolutely wonderful and versatile bird that has tons going for her. I only have one. Which you have one. I have none. But it's not as popular. This chicken is not as popular as really it should be. 
I would take a Dominique over a Bard Rock any day. There's nothing wrong with a Bard Rock, but Dominiques are absolutely fantastic. They check off like a million boxes. Yeah. They are smart. They're sweet and friendly. They're very hardy. They're very good layers. They can be dual purpose. They are predator savvy, and they're of great historical significance. They are often credited with being the first American breed. Yep. The Dominique is several hundred years old, and they can still be found on various living history sites throughout the U.S. Right. We saw them at Colonial Williamsburg. Mm-hmm. They also remain very popular with people whose ancestors kept them. Right. I think there was a book you were talking about at some point. I'll mention it later on. Yeah, yeah. that yep. had like somebody who talked about yeah. the Dominique. They're currently listed in the watch category of the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. They were critically endangered at one point. I mean, in the past, so with chickens and popularity, mm-hmm. they've moved up because they're more readily available. But this breed is not that readily available in farm supply stores. You have no. to do some digging to find the you Dominique, do. which, again, I sound like a broken record, but this is why I say they're not off the watch list because they right. need to be more readily available. I mean, I get that people just want to go into a farm supply store and buy a bird, but half the time you're ending up with hybrid layers. I would recommend a Dominique for a beginner. For someone who's had chickens forever, I mean, these really are the most versatile birds. So we'll give their history. In the early days of European exploration and colonialism, sailors figured out pretty quickly that keeping livestock on islands where they could stop for provisions along the way was a really smart thing to do. Hence the name Dominique. Right. (laughs) Essentially, a chicken or a sheep or a pig, whatever, might not survive the whole voyage. But they could stop at an island in, say, the Caribbean. Exactly. And pick up fresh livestock for the remainder of the journey. I mean, think about this way, how close the Caribbean is to the eastern coast of the United States. Right. It's very close. Exactly. Europeans had established ports in the Canary Islands and in the Caribbean before they ventured to America. The first English ships coming to the New World did use these island stops on their way to setting up Jamestown, Virginia. And... People get this wrong a lot, too. Jamestown was the first English colony. Right. In the New World, it was not Massachusetts. Right. Eventually, the British adopted Bermuda as their halfway supply point. But there were some other ships that headed to Jamestown, supply ships that came in later years. They did venture to Hispaniola and San Domingue. Which we know that's where this chicken got its name. Right. And so they headed there before heading north to the Chesapeake Bay. Right. The Dominiques are believed to get their name from the island that was once Hispaniola and Santo Domingo, or in French, San Dominique. Right. It's now known as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Exactly. It's widely believed that our modern Dominique is a descendant of chickens sourced from the islands and brought to America by sailors. Colonists may have bred them for the standard appearance. We don't really know what the earliest Dominiques look like. I mean, they're barred. Exactly. Very barred. And for people, because you want a reference point, if you want to look this chicken up while we're talking about it, they look a lot like your Plymouth Bard Rock. They just have a different comb, basically. I keep saying it's the opposite way. The Bard Rock looks a lot yeah, like the Dominique. I, I mean, just for, I'm just trying to put it in perspective of what people know so mm-hmm. that they... So... They have a tighter barring. Yeah. They have a tighter barring than the Bard Rock. So if you see them from a distance, they're more, say, blue or gray. Yeah. Where the Bard Rock, you can see more of that graphic black and white. But they're very close. They're all, Both of them are very close to each other. It is possible that the colonists were breeding them for that standard appearance of the barring because it gives them surprisingly good camouflage against predators. Yeah, exactly. They can really blend in. At one point, the Bard Rock and the Dominique could both have straight and rose comb. But the APA said definitively, you know, the Dominique is, is this rose comb and, and then the Bard Rock is going to have the yeah. straight comb. So, I mean, honestly, I, their body shape, everything about them, they resemble each other. And th- I mean, that's a reason because the Bard Rock came from part of the Dominique. I, I mean, think if you put and I'm splitting hairs here, if you put them next to each other, the Dominique does have a very unusual body shape. You'd have to have them next to each other. Like I said, I'm splitting hairs. Yeah, because to me, they look, I mean, the body shapes even to me look a lot alike. No, and their feathering is different too. I mean, the Bard Rock came from the Dominique, no doubt. (laughs) But, you know, I mean, just they're a really good chicken. I mean, they're amazing little chickens. Oh, no, we don't know, because some of you have this question. We don't know for sure how the chickens got to the islands to begin with. 
It could have been early sailors. I mean, there are any number of ways they could have gotten there. Right. But there are any number of old European breeds that may have been traded. Right. Or just left on the island. I mean, there are a lot of candidates for ways that these birds could have gotten there. They have there. a very compact body, very utilitarian, just good, well-rounded compact, chicken. They're compact and heavy at the same time. Yeah, they're solid chickens. They are. They're worker bees. That's well, what they are. Yes. So Dominiques would have been kept by all socio and economic classes, like across the board. Right. A middle class farm wife, a landed gentleman, and an enslaved family would all have happily kept this amazing little chicken. Yeah. As they spread across colonial America, the name changed a bit here and there. Right here where we are, they were pretty much known as the Dominique. Right. The Livestock Conservancy notes that in many areas, they were called Dominics, Dominickers, Dominicos, and more rarely, blue-spotted hens and old gray hens. They had a lot of nicknames. A lot of nicknames. And they're probably regional. Yeah, I'm sure that one person called them something else and then they changed the name. Hey, I do that to a lot of stuff. Sing songs and change the names of things. I've never heard you do that. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. So, you know, I mean, it's really easy to see how in one geographical area mm -hmm. they were called this and that. Yeah. And this is what you were referencing earlier. So there's a food historian and author named Michael Twitty. Yeah, this is what we were talking about. We talked about that book many times back before. Yeah. So he has a book called The Cooking Gene, and it's really a history of African-American cooking. And he mentions that his ancestors always kept flocks of Dominickers. Yeah. And his, you know, he remembers his grandmothers and great uncles and great aunts having them around. Right. Farm families who would have been traveling west took their Dominiques with them in their covered wagons. They also became popular showbirds. So you had the more ritzy side of life there. Exactly. They were present at the very first U.S. poultry show in Boston in 1849. They were there. They were. They said, I'm here. <laughs> and they were included in the American Poultry Association's first edition of the Standard of Perfection, printed in 1874 in the American class, of course. Exactly. That's why there are Fourth of July chicken, because... They've been here the longest. Great American chicken. They really are. I think last year we did Java because they're also the longest chicken here. Yeah, they were the second popular. Yeah. And just their name, Java, is telling you that they might have been coming from, again, yeah. chickens on an island. Exactly. So the Dominique remained reasonably popular all through the 18th and 19th centuries up until the 20th century. So they were around during the Great Depression. And in fact, you know, as a homestead breed, they were essentially something that was giving people the way to survive by selling eggs, by maybe eating excess chickens. Yeah, exactly. Because so the dual purpose. Exactly. So they got everyone through these rough years, but then they started disappearing in the 40s and 50s. And by the 70s, there were only a handful of Dominique flocks left in the entire country. In the early days of the Livestock Conservancy, this is back way, way back when they were called the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they were formed in the 1970s. And way back then, they started a Dominique breeding program because there were only four known flocks of Dominiques left in the country. And they needed to be preserved like as soon as possible, like right away. It's the same story as most of these chickens of those time eras, mm -hmm. you know, World yeah. War II, 40s, 50s, all this time. And then the industrial chicken came in and heritage breeds. This is why we've kind of taken this platform under our wing, pardon the pun, pun but, um, to go back to heritage breeds because without the heritage breed, there is no other breed, okay? We have to save them. And that's what happened in the 40s, 50s. They got swallowed up. Well, this is a breed that has arguably some very important genetics. I mean, they're a do-it-all chicken. Yeah. So, I mean, the moral of the story is don't let them go. No. Thank goodness there were four flocks left and someone came in and said, I'm going to help them. Essentially, yeah. The and did what people are doing today. And, you know, thank you to the Livestock Conservancy for doing their census and counting the flocks mm -hmm. because, you know, they're saving these different breeds. One of which it comes to my mind is one like the Salmon Favorals. Right. You know, that's going near extinction. And then all of a sudden we bring some attention to that breed and it picks it up and then it takes it out of those categories. The Dominique Club of America was also formed in the early 70s for the same reason, yeah. to help promote and protect the breed. And I just want to make a little note here. The reason that we are so focused on heritage breeds, it's not elitist. 
We're not saying that they're somehow better than the average hybrid layer you can get in a feed store. What we are saying is their genetics are stronger. First are stronger. Of all. And let's say, I mean, you know, let's just indulge the farthest off prepper fantasy that you can get. The grid goes down, everything crashes. Your hybrids are dead in four years. Your Dominiques, you can have a thriving flock. Right. Or any heritage breed. These breeds, the genetics are stronger. They're going to get sick less. Right. All because of the genetics being stronger. But right. when you mess with genetics, it weakens that whole type of chicken. Absolutely. And my thing is, the other chickens would not exist without them. So we can't yeah. really forget about them and go away from Especially them. Especially your barred rocks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know... That barred rocks are used in so many hybrids. They're one of the, I would say barred rocks, leghorns, and Rhode Island reds are probably the three most important breeds for hybrids, right? Right. So if you don't protect those breeds, then you don't have the hybrids that you want, the mega egg layers and everything Mm -hmm. else. But the problem is, if you want a chicken that's going to live for you eight to 10 years, you need to go heritage. And my dolly is six, and she's still going strong with the egg laying. Yeah. And the other thing is, we do need to preserve history and these chickens and their lives mean something. Well, it's a bird that, like we said, enslaved people had it. Free black people had them. Rich white men had them. Middle class women had them. They really were like a bird for everyone. Yeah, they were. And that's what heritage breeds are. They're just not going to give you your immediate satisfaction of 300 eggs in the first year. Exactly right. Pretty close to it, though. I'll tell you. They, they're, they're good, good layers. layers. Yeah. So they only have the one color variety. Exactly. And it's barred. Yeah. It's a black white <laughs> bar. Yeah. It makes them very, very easy. Hey, to that's for. easy. They yeah. have the yellow legs. Love those yellow legs. Mm-hmm. And... Red faces. Now, I haven't really met a lot of chickens that don't have red faces, combs, and waddles. Sometimes you get a bird whose face is entirely feathered, like the Barnevelder. Yeah, but it's so funny. It's because, and I always, like, every time we say this, I'm like, most chickens have red faces, (laughs) combs, and waddles. White face, black Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) The exception. Right. The exception to the rule. And here's the thing. They have the small rose comb. So that is one of the major differences between them and the Plymouth Barker. And it has a little point on the back. It's very cute. Yeah. It's not the big rose comb. Right. No, it's a smaller uh, one. um, Old English pheasant fowl or the red cap. The red caps, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. They have the massive one. Yeah. Let's go over size. They are that medium utilitarian, that medium-sized birds, they are, the roosters are going to weigh in at about seven pounds, and the hens are going to come in at about five pounds. Mm-hmm. So, like Holly Ann was saying, their barring is a little, their feathering is a little tighter, and you're going to find that on the American breeds. You want the feathers to be a little tighter because it's going to protect them against the elements a little bit more. Yeah, wind and rain, all of those things. You'll find it on some of the continental breeds, but I feel like most of the American breeds have that tight feathering. Yeah. Americans are like, look, you got to be sturdy out there. You got to be able to get through snow, wind, rain, everything. Yeah. And those I mean, feathers being tight, think of it as like armor against the weather. It stops the weather from getting to the skin. But I just want to make a little note, since this is our 4th of July history episode, even in colonial America, people had chicken coops. <laughs> Don't believe all those. It's a myth when people say, our grandmothers kept our chickens in trees. If you did, your chickens were going to die really early. Even in colonial America, there were chicken coops. If there wasn't a coop, there was a barn. There was something. Something. There exactly. was some sort of... Chickens need shelter. I'm going to tell you this. I go to Costa Rica. There are... Even there in the jungle, mm-hmm. they have buildings and barns for chickens. Yeah, yeah. So they have to have some place to roost and feel safe at night to sleep. Right, exactly. That's for sure. Okay, so like you were saying, the hens are really good layers. The Dominique is the worker bee, like I was saying, 250 to 280. That's a lot of eggs per year. And some have even hit 300 plus. And they're brown. Yeah, it's a brown egg. It's not a dark brown, medium brown egg. So they can go broody. Now, Mm -hmm. Occasionally, you may find one that does. Uh, Generally, be, they don't. They probably went broody more back in their history. Like anything, as it's not needed, they tend to lose it. Right. So you do still have a Dominique Hamel go broody, but early on, I'm sure that they were a lot broodier and that's what kept the bloodlines going. Well, yeah, exactly. And then they're like, I don't need to send on these eggs. Right. I'm not doing this. For Dolly's that. never gone broody. <laughs> <laughs> so, like you were saying, they make an exceptional homestead breed. Mm hmm. They're a smart chicken. They're great. They have the barring, the camouflage. They love bugs. They love gardening. 
They're all around a great chicken. It's a thrifty bird. They do, and they're very good foragers. They're hardy in a wide variety of climates. So it's no surprise to us that they were so popular here in the Mid Atlantic because they could handle both heat and cold. Oh, I, one thing. Does Dolly start earlier? Is she more of a winter layer? Oh, Dolly's a winter layer. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she generally is laying by the end of February at the latest. Yeah, because my barred rocks, they start mm-hmm. in like end of January, early February, yeah. laying eggs again. I want to say my earliest layers are, and this one's kind of weird. My earliest layers are Blanche Dubois, the Easter Egger, mm. the Jersey Giant Hens, the Swedish Flower Hens, and Dolly. Those are my earliest. Yeah, my barred are and my And they're first. followed by the Asiatics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dolly Madison, she was given to me by a neighbor mm-hmm. who got her by accident from, I think, my pet chicken. Oh, really? She didn't want her? Yeah, pure Swedish flower. Oh, so she came with a honeysuckle bluebell. She came with bluebell. Oh, okay. Yeah, she had gotten them both from My Pet Chicken. Okay. And Dolly was the wrong breed. And you know, My Pet Chicken was wonderful. They refunded her and apologized yeah. and all. She was like, I don't want a Dominique in the Swedish flower flock because she was running because them. Because of the eggs. Exactly. So she just gave her to me along with Bluebell. And I don't think I've ever gotten a better gift. Yeah. I mean, these are birds that deserve to be way more appreciated. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like the birds that work the hardest for you don't get appreciated. That's yeah. part of it's that old thing that everybody says, the harder you work, the more work somebody puts on you. And it's true. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, in life. Yeah. And it is the same for chickens, I feel like, you know. Well, because of that great personality, they are wonderful birds for families. And they'd be really good 4-H birds for kids who wanted to show. Yeah. Who wanted to get into chickens. They make absolutely fantastic additions to both American breed flocks mm. and to laid back mixed flocks. But Dominiques are not pushovers. Okay. They, they so will, are they in the middle of the pack then? Well, Dolly's number two after Pansy now. Oh. And some okay. of that seniority. Yes, but she's moved up because there were yes. a lot more in that flock yes. that were ahead of her. She was always a, below the rest of the Swedish flowers. But so she was in the middle at Pansy's my only purebred Swedish flower yeah. hen now. And so it's Pansy and Dolly. Yeah. Yeah. And she has that second position due to seniority. I think it's a combination of seniority. She's been challenged here and there. And right. she gently puts everyone back in their place. It's kind of like Bubbles, my buff Orpington, has that top spot due to seniority. Mm-hmm. She's been there the longest. No one's going to mess with her. Right. They're not tempting her. Right. They're just like, oh, okay. Even when she was lower on the totem pole, so to speak, she didn't let people push her around too much. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So th- they'll stand up for themselves if they need to, but they're not troublemakers and they're not like... Social climbers, so to speak. Yeah, those are the ones that cause a little bit more drama in a flock. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so where do we get them? That's the question. As we said earlier, they are still not common enough to show up in most feed stores, which is a gosh darn shame. But you can get some really lovely Dominiques from Murray McMurray Hatchery. Of course you can because they love the heritage breeds. Yes. You can also check the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory And you can Google breeders in your area. There are breeders out there. You just have to find them. Yeah, it's one of those chickens that I always say is like a scavenger hunt trying to find sometimes. But Murray McMurray is not a scavenger hunt. You can go there. The thing I recommend about McMurray Hatchery is go early and know what you're going to do in November for the spring. Have your plan and be ready to put it into play because you need to move quickly. And then you can get exactly what you want. And you're you're not like going in saying, oh, my God, I don't have what I need. So if you go in early and you want like the Dominique for your flock, they have them. You can order them. And that's just as easy as going to the feed store. They are. So, you know, we always joke about this, but your apocalypse chicken. Yeah. And, you know, there are a million breeds that I love. But like you only need if you can only have one breed of chicken and they had to be super hardy, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. For me, it would be between the Swedish flower and the Dominique and the Dominique might win it. Oh, okay. I'm talking about like rough and tumble homestead doing all birds. I don't know who I would pick because, I mean, my barred rock would be the closest thing to them. Yeah. For like, you know, just rough and tough, but none of mine are like rough and tough. The Morans, man, they'll take you down. Here's the thing. I never would have known about the Dominiques if Kitty hadn't given Dolly to me. So I would have been in the same boat as you with my Favaroles and my Cochins and Brahmas. Sudans. Although the Swedish flowers, I mean... They're not everyone's chicken, but they're an awesome breed. Yeah. So that is the amazing Dominique. If you have not checked them out, do it. So 
If you have the Dominique, flood our DMs with your pictures of this amazing chicken. We want to give you a story. We want to showcase your chickens. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. This week for our main topic, we're talking about chickens at the Eisenhower farm. Yes. Yes, because, you know, it's 4th of July and we want to stay historic. The chicken ladies love a good historical site that has heritage breed livestock, especially chickens, right? Right. So I don't think there are current, you didn't see chickens, did you? No. There are no current animals on the Eisenhower farm. But we did visit. We were heading up towards our new coffee sponsor, Bantam Roasters, which is in Gettysburg. Gettysburg is about an hour from my house. It's about, yeah, an hour and a half from me, an hour from Mm -hmm. you. And... We're actually so lucky to be close to a lot of different historical sites. Being Mid-Atlantic, East Coast, we are so close to D.C., New York, Philly, everything that you'd want to know about Mm -hmm. colonial or the start of America, we're all right here. So we took a little road trip to Gettysburg. Right. We wanted to see if there was anything in the area that had to do with chickens, and we found the Eisenhower Farm. Yes. The Eisenhower Farm was the home of the 34th U.S. President, Dwight David Eisenhower, and his wife, Mary Dowd Eisenhower, better known as Mamie. Right. Now, Mamie, I kind of like Mamie a lot. Mamie was a style icon and noted hostess. She was as happy to entertain guests and foreign dignitaries at the farm as she had been at the White House. And she liked pink. Have you ever seen her official White House portrait from 1959? Yes, I did. Yes. With the pink dress and the pearls. I love that. It's so pretty. Eisenhower bought the 189-acre farm in Gettysburg in 1950. So very early on in their marriage, he and Mamie had lived in Gettysburg when he was stationed there during the First World War Okay, as the commander of Camp Colt, and that was the U.S. Army's Tank Corps Training Center. Okay. Yeah. But they had loved the Gettysburg area, and they were happy to return. The Eisenhower settled in happily. They made the farm their home base. They launched Eisenhower's presidential run there back in 1952, and they continued to use the farm as a weekend retreat during the presidential years. Okay, nice. Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, Nikita Khrushchev, and many others were all visitors to the farm during the Cold War years. Nice. I mean, who doesn't want to visit a farm? That's why we went. It's a beautiful farm. Farms are beautiful. And it's a beautiful area. Even if they're a working farm. Mm -hmm. I live in an area where there's a lot of working farms. You live in an area where there's a lot of working farms. And there's nothing more beautiful than driving through and peaceful at that. Yeah. They're just, it's just awesome. So after the White House years, the Eisenhowers moved back to the farm full time. And this was interesting to me. And this is the reason we were able to see it. Right. They eventually donated the property to the National Park Service. So they made the donation in 1967, but they kept lifetime residence rights. Right. So the, they're owned, it's owned by the National Park System. Right. Which keeps it up. Yeah. So what does all this have to do with chickens? Well, we know he had chicken. Right. It's a little known fact of U.S. history that Eisenhower the soldier was also Eisenhower the farmer. He had grown up in Kansas. He was the child of Mennonite farmers. Okay. And his mother, she sounds like this little powerhouse of a woman. Right. She insisted that the boys grow up with a strong work ethic. They all had to contribute to the household work. And most of it at that time was considered women's work. Right. Right. I mean, I was way back. And she didn't have any daughters. She only had the boys. But she said she would have done this anyway. All of the boys had to wash dishes. They had to do laundry. They had to cook. 
clean, milk the cows, feed and care for the chickens, and collect the eggs. That sounds like what my girls would say I make them do. I look at the chickens as a way to teach children responsibility and care and love and respect. And, you know, this is what she did to her boys is if you care and tend to something and love them, they give you something in return in this egg and your breakfast. And she taught them that, which is excellent. But chickens can teach children so much. Oh, absolutely. There were a couple of byproducts, other byproducts from this too. Eisenhower became an excellent cook. He was well known as an excellent cook. He developed this deep attachment to the animals, which we'll see in a little bit here. He was also allowed to sell excess garden vegetables to townspeople in order to supplement the farm's income. Right. So fast forward, he's on the Eisenhower farm. He very happily establishes a flock of black Angus cows, which that's a lot of what he was known for. Yeah, if you go through the barn, there are tons and tons of show banners hanging from where he showed the... And when we went on the farm, you can go through the barn and look Mm -hmm. at everything. I mean, it really is, when you go back, like, it's still set back in time. It's very cool. I mean, both the house... And the barn. It's very mid-century, but it's mid-century country style. Yeah. Like there's an office in the barn and it has these glass doors and things. Yeah. And the house is, again, it's very mid-century, but it's also, you can tell it's the 50s and 60s. Rotary phone. Right? (laughs) The rotary phone's kind of cool. I found some early correspondence reference that was between Eisenhower and the former owner of this farm. Essentially, we found out that when Eisenhower bought the farm, there were... Plymouth Bard Rock chickens living there. Mm -hmm. There are your Bard Rocks again. There's my Bard Rocks. Later, this is in about 1955, when he had bought the farm and he was still living in the White House. I love this story. Eisenhower went on a visit to New Hampshire. Local dignitaries happily presented him with some unusual gifts. He was given a Black Angus heifer and a trio of New Hampshire cockerel and hens. There's your New Hampshire, that other great American breed. Right. And the president was delighted by these gifts. Yeah. They say he made a speech with the heifer bellowing. And the whole crowd, you know, just thought this was hilarious and wonderful. It's just a little peek into, I think, a, a historical site that people don't really know about if they're not local. No. When we go looking for stuff that we want to do in our material, we find these places because that's what we like to do. We like to go back and visit farming. We love these chickens and the, the aspect of farming them so much. Mm-hmm. It is cool to go back in history and see what historical people and how they did have a love for chickens because the people now that have the love for chickens don't really realize where it comes from. It makes me wonder, you know, if he's entertaining Winston Churchill or Nikita Khrushchev, did they stroll through the barn? I'm sure they did. Did they walk by the chicken coops? Yeah, and sit in those old raw iron uh, white furniture. Garden furniture. The furniture in the front, which Mm -hmm. every grandparent that we've ever had had in their yard. Yep. It's nice to see that. And it's nice when you look at this chicken like this, the Dominique that we showcased this week, and see where they come from and see that in our history, we're all chicken tenders, kind of. (laughs) You know, and even presidents of the United States go back and grew up on a farm in Kansas and had chickens. And his mom told me he had to go get the eggs. Yeah. And milk the cows. Yeah. His mother sounds kind of amazing. And we are like here, I'm really kind of like when it's summertime, the girls are about chicken chores Mm -hmm. and they're filling the waters and cleaning the bowls and doing everything that they need to do. It's automatic for me. I mean, you know, that's one of the biggest things I learned from my mother. The animals first. Yeah. But the animals first. It's teaching the kids for me these days that everything doesn't come so easily. Right. You know, like you can't just pick up your phone. You have to fill up the gallon of water. A little Walk back to the chickens, take care of them, look at them, think, and hug and snuggle them too while you're back there. Oh, so much hugging and snuggling. I think that caring for something else is good for people in general. I just oh, think it's yeah. healthy. And I also think that it just teaches you a work ethic and some responsibility that maybe it would take longer for a young person to learn if they didn't grow up doing these things. Oh, yeah, for sure. So there's our visit. It was so nice. Mm -hmm. We had great coffee at Bantam Roasters. It's it's a beautiful farm. Chad and Alex are so amazing. Love those two. We'll put, there's a link through the National Park Service. You can actually see a 3D tour, I think, of the house and the barn. Yeah, you can go on the website. We'll put that in the show notes so you can take a look at this place. Very cool. And if you're close within the East Coast, go visit and then go visit Bantam Coffee Roasters and get your coffee. They're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Just a note. Just a note. Okay. 
So are we ready to move on to cracking the eggs? Cracking those eggs now. Oh, this is a good one. This week's recipe, I think last year we also did an ice cream. We did a vanilla custard ice cream last year. And this year it's mulberry cobbler ice cream. Because 4th of July, you just think of ice cream and you don't think that ice cream has eggs in it, but yes, it does. It does, yeah. Some of it doesn't, but we do an old-fashioned custard ice cream. Yeah, the custard definitely does. And there's something about custard that's different than just plain ice cream. It's so much better. It's so much richer. The mouthfeel, it's creamy and thick and oh, it's so good. Like when I go to when I go to the beach, Ocean City, they have the regular ice cream or the Coors custard. Yep. The old family Coors custard. I always get the custard. I always did back in the day when I could have dairy. Yeah. So I made this so that you can eat it whether you can have dairy or not. <laughs> This is a very rich ice cream. It has four egg yolks. I just cooked the whites and gave them to my dogs. Yeah. The whites are easy just to cook up Mm -hmm. if you don't want to use them. Now, this recipe, we did mulberries because they were in season when I was developing it. Mulberries are in season now. But you can use any color raspberries. You can use wine berries, blackberries, pretty much any berry, like small vine berries are interchangeable here. We just, I mean, we had a bumper crop of mulberries on the my family farm this year. My neighbor has a mulberry bush, mm-hmm. a mulberry tree. Yeah. Yeah, they're trees, yeah. Someday remind me to tell you the story about the mulberry tree. Not today, but I will tell you. You know the story. I I'm did. saying to everybody else. Right. And like I said, I did develop and test this as gluten and dairy free. Works very well. There are several steps to this. There are very easy steps. The custard base does require chilling. So you want to start it a day before or at least... Do it early in the morning on the day you're going to make it. You'll also make the cobbler bits ahead of time so that they're completely cooled and ready to mix in. And just a reminder, because I didn't do it this time, but I've done it so many times. If you're using an electric ice cream machine, make sure your canister is frozen. I know. Put it in there. That's what I do. Yeah. I, I keep it in there now. Yeah. It's frozen. You plug it in and it does that turning for you. Yep. It's great. Yep, it turns, yeah. And let me tell you, when I do the ice cream, that everybody in this household is like, this is so much better than it's store-bought so ice cream. Good. Oh, my it's God. so good. Let's go through ingredients quickly. Now, we're not going to go through exactly every step on the podcast. The right. recipe will be on our website. So you can get step by step. But this kind of has multiple phases to it. So let's go through the ingredients so that you know what you're going to need. You're going to need a half a cup of full-fat milk. For dairy-free, you're going to use two and a half cups of the thickest dairy-free milk or dairy-free cream or half and half that you can find. And Holly Ann, what did you use? We used Calafia, dairy-free half and half. That's good stuff. That's perfect. You're going to need two cups of heavy cream. For the dairy people. For the dairy people. Right. Okay. Two-thirds to three-quarters of a cup of sugar. You know what I'm going to say. We're bumping that up. You don't really need to, though, because mulberries are very sweet. Oh, I like it sweet. Okay. I like it sweet. You go for it. Four egg yolks, like Holly Ann said, because it's going to make it really rich. That's what makes these custards really rich. Mm -hmm. A teaspoon of vanilla extract, because nothing you can do with... You need need vanilla vanilla and everything. Everything gets vanilla. Everything (laughs) needs vanilla. And if you're like me and you go to Mexico, always get that vanilla. I've used that vanilla so many times, I feel like I've barely put a dent in that jar. Isn't or, it the best? I should say that bottle. Isn't it the best, though? I just stand there and smell it. It's so good. It doesn't get better than Mexican vanilla. Mm. Two to two and a half cups of ripe berries. Like Holly said, you can use any different kind of varieties that you want. We use small berries. A tablespoon of lemon juice. Now, for the cobbler, you're going to make like kind of a standard cobbler. You're going to use three tablespoons of butter or dairy-free butter cut into chunks, and it has to be pretty cold. Yeah. A half a cup of sugar, a half a teaspoon of vanilla, of course, a half a cup of all-purpose flour or the gluten-free one-to-one, and a half a teaspoon of the baking powder. Okay, so that's for the cobbler part of there's, the ice cream. There's also a teaspoon of salt for that, but that's only if you're using unsalted butter. If you're using dairy-free butter or regular salted butter, just leave that salt out. All I ever buy is unsalted butter. Well, that's so. what I did back in the day, but guess what? They, yeah. don't, make, they don't make unsalted dairy-free really? butter. Not that I found. So it all has salt in it. Yeah, so I just, oh. I just leave... If I'm developing a recipe, I just leave it out. But something where I know people are going to be using unsalted butter, I try to note it. Right. Okay. So you're going to, the next step is kind of preparing the berries. Yeah. You're going to pick through the berries, take out anything that looks bad, put the rest into a sieve or not a colander. You really want a sieve. Yeah. Like a mesh sieve. 
You're going to set the sieve over a small saucepan, use a spoon or a cup or whatever, smash the berries against the sieve until no more juice runs out of them. I put them aside and take them out to the chickens. Yeah. And they lose their mind eating the pulp. You're going to add about a third of a cup of sugar. You're essentially going to add half of your sugar to this. You're making kind of like... Almost like a jelly, kind of. Exactly. You're not going to make it that thick. Because when you put berries and sugar together, it's going to congeal and... You're going to throw the lemon juice in there too. You're going to place it over medium to low heat and cook it, stirring often until the juices come to a low boil. Then you're going to turn that heat down and simmer it for another like five to eight minutes. It's essentially until the juice is thickened and it clings to the spoon or the spatula. Then you can set that aside to chill. And then you're going to move on to your custard base at this point. You're going to whisk together your egg yolks and the other half of that sugar. And that's going to make like a creamy kind of frothy kind of... Yeah, uh, like lighter in color. Mm -hmm. Set that aside. Then you're going to need another saucepan. You're going to put the milk and the cream in there. Cook it, stirring occasionally on medium low heat until the bubbles start to form at the edges and essentially until it comes to a simmer. Right. Remove from heat, stir in the vanilla, then you're going to temper your egg yolks because we talk about tempering eggs all the time. You take a spoonful of the hot stuff, so a spoonful of the cream mixture at a time, ladle it into the eggs while stirring constantly. So you don't cook them. Cook your eggs, (laughs) you know. You can't add everything in so hot to the eggs because the eggs will cook on you. So once you've gotten that in, I think you have to put like about half the cream in until it's warm enough. Right. Then you put the other half of the cream in. You're going to add the berry juice to that. So essentially, you're going to be putting all of those wet ingredients together. You're going to pop that back onto the stove, cook it at medium-low, stirring constantly until the mixture thickens and coats the back of a spoon. Now, check this frequently because you do not want to overcook your custard. No, you don't. And once that's done, you're going to chill it until cold. If, by chance, you rushed your egg tempering and you get any egg bits, just pour it through a sieve or a strainer and put it back in the fridge. And then you're going to make your cobbler. So cobbler is pretty easy thing to make. Super cobbler easy. is really cold butter, all your dry ingredients. And then you're going to use a pastry blender to make kind of this chunky. Cut the butter into it. You're going to cut the yeah. butter into it. And it makes like a chunky mixture that you're going to put on top. And it makes a really cool topping to stuff. It's so good in the ice cream. And then you're going to follow the manufacturer's instructions for your ice cream maker. However, you usually make ice cream. Now, I make the ice cream and then I sometimes can't wait. So I eat it like really quickly. And then I'm like, no, I should wait. Yeah. Because the ice cream's always better the next day. It is amazing if you wait. And we did wait, but I will say this about homemade ice cream that's the freeze a solid. It freezes solid. So the trick that I always use, I always watch people in ice cream places, they put the spoon in hot, hot water. water. Well, we tried that. <laughs> then cut through it. But. It made it more like the first day, like a soft serve, like milkshake almost. And you can do that the first day if you really want to. And it's so good. It is hard. But we put it in the freezer. We ate it the next day. And it was amazing. And I'll tell you the secret. Put the microwave on low and put the ice cream in there for five minutes. And it just barely started to melt around the edges. It was enough. My ice cream canister that my maker came with is metal that wouldn't work. No, we didn't put it in the canister. We froze it in a bowl. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so try it. You might like it. It's ice cream. Everybody likes it. It's 4th of July. Yay! July. Enjoy your ice cream. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy. Oh, my God. You're going to love this interview. We had such a great time. We sat down with Chad and Alex, the owners of Bantam Roasters, and it was so much fun. Enjoy. Okay, so for this week's retail therapy, we have a surprise today. Wait, no, we told everyone last week that it, it was... It's not a surprise? No. I always think it's a surprise. Surprise to you. Oh, it's always a surprise to me. Okay, so I'm excited about this week's guest for retail therapy. We have Chad and Alex, and they are the owners of... Bantam Coffee Roasters. Yeah, they are a coffee sponsor. We love you guys. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? We're doing great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having having us. us. Of course. Of course. I can hear a rooster in the background. (laughs) You got a couple of them running around. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So we're going to start with, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves and shocker, all your chickens. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah. So we live on a little three acre farm in East Berlin, Pennsylvania. 
we have been together for 10 years, got about 60 chickens, five ducks, two cats and a dog. <laughs> and have a coffee shop and, and, and Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's why we're here. That's what I was getting at. <laughs> we do, but we do love talking about chickens. Yeah, we love chickens. We started the coffee shop nine years ago. We roast all of our own coffee. It started out as a roastery, and then we built the cafe shortly after that. It was always a passion project of ours. We're nine years into it so far. and You are in the beautiful downtown historic Gettysburg, PA. I came to visit you with my family over the Christmas holiday, and we loved it there. We all sat in there. You were roasting the coffee yourself when we walked in. The co- Your coffee is just delicious. And that's not to mention you have a coffee truck. I feel like my husband and I, before we were married, stopped in because he uh, he lived in Hanover before we got married, before he moved to Maryland. And I'm pretty sure we stopped in there on one of our dates. (laughs) Oh, Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah. Now that you, I mean, now that you mentioned it, I'm pretty sure. Pre-marriage. Yeah. Pre-marriage. Right. Right. Obviously you have this amazing coffee. And you recently had a name change. You had a different name and you've changed to Bantam Coffee Roasters. Is this because your chickens are taking over your life? <laughs> Pretty much. Well, that was RG. We and got, he, we, we he, answered right that. he answered that for you. Yes, the chickens are taking over <laughs> our lives. We were called 82 Cafe because our address is 82 Steinwire Avenue in Gettysburg. And our roasting company was the Ragged Edge Roasting Company. Right. And then the coffee trucks were Bantam Coffee Roasters. And so we had three names. We originally got Bantam from, obviously, the Bantam Chickens. But we wanted to merge all of them together and be one big company. And so it's a coffee shop, a coffee roastery, and two coffee trucks. And you picked the right of all the names, the Bantam Coffee Roasters. That's a good one. So here's another little side story how we were all meant to be. You and I were recording one day. And Joe and Ella went for a soccer tournament in Gettysburg, right? And they sent us a photograph of one of your trucks. Of Ella in front of the truck. Yes. And they were like, look at this coffee truck. You guys have to work with them. I forgot about that. And we were like, yes, we have to work with you guys. It's just meant to be. And it was so (laughs) funny because we were working and that picture came in. We were recording. I want to go back and backtrack about your chicken. You said you have 60 chickens. Your number one breed is one of my all-time favorite breeds. It's the Sarama. Yes. Correct. Love them. How many Saramas do you have? What would you say? 20? 20, 20, yeah, 25? About, about 20, 25, yeah. And it's the breed that we started off with. We had a very small backyard in the beginning. The Sarama was just the perfect size. For a miniature them. backyard, a miniature chicken. Well, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I forget whose idea it was, but we were like, we want more. Saramas at that point were hard to find. I think we started off with five and then we started breeding. Yep. And then we got a second flock and started breeding them. And then at one point we had about 40 Sarama. It was kind of our side business, coffee and Sarama hatching. Oh my gosh, so many babies. So many babies. Wow. Babies are so tiny. I think that's part of the problem is they all look like little cotton balls with lead. We slowed down and then... Three, four years ago, we started with standard size chickens. Okay, so uh, what kind of standard t- size chickens do you have? Oh, oh, what kinds do we don't have? We have Cochins. We have Bantam Cochins. We have a few different Americanos. Wine Oats. Wine Oats. We have uh, Blue Lace Red Wine Oat. Silkies. Some Easter Eggers. Nice. You got a lot. Nice. You've got a lot. Cochins. We do. What kind um, of ducks do you have? Buff Orpington ducks. Oh, I want them so badly. Excellent taste in poultry. Thank you. So we have five of them. You'll see the conga line maybe at some <laughs> point come through the yard. What color cochins? We have blue and black. Nice. 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 Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I just got my first cochins this year. They're babies, the silver lace cochins, and they are adorable. Can't wait. The girls already call them the mini dinos because they walk like dinosaurs. Well, and we have so- two roosters. So they're even more like dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. It's like the skeleton is slightly different. Their balance is a little different. It is. Like they're a little taller and then the feathers on the legs. I don't know what it is, but they do have more of a dino look, I feel Mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you have meshed coffee and chickens. (laughs) It's just amazing to me. And that you have all these animals that you take care of. And what keeps you going is the coffee. That's for sure. 
No doubt. Love that you mesh coffee and chickens together. You know, it's just a natural thing to do. The problem, though, is drinking five cups of coffee, talking for hours, and the next thing you know, you're scrolling on Murray McMurray's website. Yes. yes. <laughs> Which ones do I want from the catalog <laughs> this year? And Ginger is our enabler. She's like, which ones do you want this year? And so, yes, it's a lot of fun with the McMurray catalog. We're super excited because some of our chickens are actually in the McMurray catalog this year. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. We're super of, excited. One of my wild Egyptian Fayumis, there's a photo of her in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'll have to look out. What's your favorite part of being a coffee shop owner? What do you love about it? The people. There is so many people different people that come through because it's a tourist town. You have no shortage of the different types of people that come through. We've met some of our greatest friends there. So yeah, it's the people for me. Great. We actually met each other at a coffee uh, shop, at a coffee shop <laughs> right before we owned it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. You know, there must be something about dates and coffee shop. Are there Gettysburg is for lovers mugs somewhere? There, there <laughs> should be. There, there should, should be. be. <laughs> our seasons used to be from, Memorial Day through Labor Day. The Battle of Gettysburg happened the 1st through the 3rd of July. So that's when everyone came to town. Now the month of October, Halloween month, rivals July and and the reenactment because so many more people are coming into Gettysburg for the ghosts more than they are, I think. Not totally. Or just as many. Or just as many. Different types of people. Have you had any strange encounters or no? No, I've tried. We've tried, but no. No, no. no. I've never encountered it myself, but the people that come, I believe that they have true, real encounters. I just personally haven't had one. And they always talk about being sensitive to to that. And Maybe we just aren't. Maybe we're not sensitive enough. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's all the coffee we drink. I would say you're pretty sensitive. Oh. He's a cancer. He's a very sensitive person. (laughs) That's sweet. That is sweet. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I love coming to downtown because walking around there and then in the fall with a cup of Bantam Coffee Roasters in your hand, man, that's going to be great. And when we were there at Christmas time, it was decorated so beautifully downtown. And just walking around, there's a nice little soap shop there. There's a lot of stuff just to walk around the candy shop. And there's something, the, the candy shop has something like 500 different kinds of soda. That oh, you, yes. Hard to find. So you can get sugar rush, both liquid and candy form. That sounds great. So I am personally addicted to the Kenyan coffee with the notes of caramel and chocolate. How do you choose the coffee flavors you're going to work with? So we get coffee from all over the world. Coffee pretty much grows between the tropics. Depending on the type of year is the coffee that's being harvested in that particular country or region of the world. Not only are we trying to get the coffee that's being harvested and brought over the freshest. Um, So that determines what kind of coffee we get. But also it's a lot of sampling. We work with some farmers around the world that we buy directly from their farms. And we work with a couple of different brokers that bring in coffee into the country. And then we sample their coffees and then we'll purchase from kind of an intermediary. Okay. And it's just a lot of sampling, roasting, sampling again i always say that the coffee that we get coffee is a lot like wine depending on the temperature the altitude the soil the minerals in the soil all influences how coffee will taste Mm -hmm. and then of course the love that the farmers put into it again we sample a ton of different coffee but it's really the farmers that we get who develop these great coffees roasting it i just try not to mess it up before i get it from bean to your cup we just play around with with that roast level to to make it perfect it's really those coffees that we find from the farmers themselves it is super smooth your coffee is smooth it's delicious it just has a really good taste and i love the fact that on each bag you say what country it's from and then with the notes of the flavors right on there but like I said, it's such a smooth cup of coffee that it lets you drink multiple oh, cups so in a good. row. And then all of a sudden you're talking really fast. You tell your cardiologist it wasn't us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Why is your heart rate 210? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about the coffee truck and how that came about. You travel around with the coffee truck, correct? We do. 
And I'll talk about the truck just because Alex prefers to be in the brick and mortar and stationary. I'm more the one that takes the trailer around. But we started out in... I'm a homebody. She is a homebody. (laughs) I get Uh, it. We started out in 2016 with a little cart. And it was just a way to take our coffee outside of Gettysburg. And also to attend a lot of the different street fairs and brew fests and wine festivals about 50 miles outside of Gettysburg. Before, we were always in the brick and mortar, but this gave us an opportunity to not only work, but work in a fun environment. Since then, it's developed into two mobile trailers where, as of last year, we were doing 50-some-odd events, you know, constantly traveling around with them. It's everything that you can get in our cafe, but mobile will come to your door or to whatever festival is nearby. And it just allows us to further branch out and have people try our coffee that aren't in Gettysburg. You know, we come to you. Can people hire you like for weddings or things like that? I was just about to say, we've gotten contacted about weddings and stuff. We haven't figured it out yet, but yeah. We haven't fully branched out to do that just because, you know, we've done more festival type things with it than Mm -hmm. private events. We have had people inquire. That is definitely a possibility. We have two more questions for you. And the first is, what does the future look like for Bantam Coffee Roasters? So we're just going to stay where we're at in Gettysburg for now. We like to do (laughs) one thing very well at a time. So we'll do coffee. We're just going to be picking up. We have bagels, but we will be picking up breakfast sandwiches with our eggs. Nice. That's soon in the future for us. Maybe down the line, more locations. And we've looked at opening other locations. Yeah. We're always trying to grow. We're always trying to be better with the products that we put out. So not only with the cafe, putting a lot of work into our cafe now, making it a little bit more cozy. We're continuing with the new branding. There'll be a lot of chicken-related coffee blends and roasts coming in the near future. Yay! That sounds good. Like our hen house blend. Our hen house blend. Oh, yeah. Is our newest one. After collecting so many chickens over the last couple of years, we sell our eggs in the shop. I love it. In cartons, we're now looking to maybe start using the eggs for breakfast sandwiches. Nice. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. I love to come full circle, Mm. coffee and chickens, and then you can come in and buy your chicken eggs and an egg sandwich. That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Hidden in in the cartons, you can find some blue and green eggs in there. Yeah, Bantam slider egg sandwiches. Feel the recipes in my head turning. (laughs) (laughs) I'm already there. We might have to develop you a recipe, (laughs) a coffee with the chicken ladies recipe. Chicken lady sandwich. (laughs) Easily. We're super excited for you guys. And we're so glad that we all met. Instant friends. I love the cafe. We sat in there and drank our coffees one day. I get to ask the last question, and it is the most unfair question of all. Of all time. And we ask it anyway. We're going to ask each one of you. Alex, we'll start with you. What is your favorite breed or breeds of chicken? Oh, okay. I'm glad you said breeds. Uh Uh-huh. We have to. I do prefer my Silky just because she's adorable. She doesn't love being held, which is unfortunate. I really like Buff Orbington's. Me too. Very sweet. I'll keep it a look. Buff Orbitons for the personality. Chad. I have a little phantom frizzle coaching hen. She's very cute. That I call my little meatball because she looks like a little meatball. I have a standard coaching, a blue coaching. So coaching's your favorite. Coaching's are my favorite. I like the feathered legs. I like <laughs> Wait the a minute. Legs. Wait a minute. Excellent taste. Where chicken. is the Sarama? In it? <laughs> well, the Saramas are a given. They're like our children, you know. It's an automatic. Sarama. They're automatic. Favorite. You got an amazing chicken there with the frizzle oh and phantom coaching. Oh yeah. my goodness. And a name like Meatball? Run, that is so cute. Yeah, <laughs> Meatball. When they run, they, they, hop. they hop. They don't run with their legs. They hop with <laughs> their feet. And it's so cute. It's so cute. They're ridiculous. I love them. Oh my God. We just want to say thank you to both of you for coming on and chatting with us over the hour. It's so much fun. Chad and I had met in December, but for all of us to get to know each other, And you guys are the sweetest. And we love the fact that you put coffee and chickens together. This is like a match made in heaven. Man, it is ridiculously awesome. I love the fact that you're going to be using your eggs to sell in the store. Love that. But thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us. Absolutely. Thank Thank you. you so much for having us. 
Okay, we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. We just want to thank Chad and Alex one more time for a really fun interview. I love those little bantams they have. Oh, my God. Archie is so cute. <laughs> Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are doing another historical breed of great importance in the formation of a lot of our modern breeds, and that is the Dorking. Funny story. I was talking about the Dorking the other day, and Joe got all mad, thought I called him a dork. Stop. (laughs) (laughs) Main topic, it's that time. How hot is too hot for your chickens? We're going to help you beat the summer heat. We're going to give you some good tips. Cracking the eggs, we're doing old fashioned vanilla custard. So good on a summer night. And retail therapy, we're going to have some vintage fun. We're going to do Avon chicken collectibles. How many people remember getting those catalogs as kids? I remember them. I think there's a fair amount of our listeners who do. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.